I am going through the book of Daniel, uh, prophetical book of Daniel. Very intense, very revealing, even to our times today. The title of my sermon today is Finding God, Then Our Faith Gets Tested. Finding God, Then Our Faith is Challenged. There are times our faith, Christian faith, would get challenged. And I put down ten reasons here today. When you receive uh, not so good news from the doctor, your faith is challenged. Get tested. When your spouse comes to you, um, I'm counseling a few couples these days, and then tells you that I'm not happy in marriage, leaving, and your faith gets tested. When the stock market is down, I know so many folks have lost their money, and we pastors have little retirements at Baptist Convention. We were told that we lost about 25% in three months, gone. And our faith gets tested. When you get a letter from your bank saying that your bank balance is low, your faith gets tested. And when your children are out in the world without the fear of God wandering away, your faith gets tested. Even when your parents don't listen to God. I've counseled some children who had concerns about their parents. Your faith gets tested. When you're incarcerated, whether for right reasons or wrong reasons, emotionally or physically, your faith gets tested. When you hear that your business is going belly up, your faith gets tested. When you hear there are malicious folks, even claiming to be Christians, trying to destroy you, your faith gets tested. And finally, put right, in my, put right in my notes is when the laws of the land are passed against Christian faith and Christian morals, your faith gets tested. You could add on. The Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their faith was tested. Last Sunday, I preached about Daniel chapter 2, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar dreamt a dream. He was so disturbed in his spirit. So he orders all the enchanters, magicians, sorcerers, wise men, Chaldeans, all of them to come and reveal the meaning of the dream. And I'm going to kind of recap what I said last Sunday so that would set the stage for what I'm going to preach today. In the PowerPoint, I put the same thing that I did last Sunday. The dream had four sections. The head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs were made of iron, and feet were clay and iron joined together, weak and strong. And Daniel explained that to the king, O king, the golden head is you, strong kingdom, then the lesser potent kingdom would come right after you, and then another lesser kingdom, that is Greeks, then Romans would come. So Babylonian kingdom, Medo-Persian kingdom, following them would Greek kingdom, then Romans, and the Romans would split into ten. And finally... A large rock would be cut off from heaven, come down and destroy everything, and the dust would be like the mountain, filling the entire universe. I'm talking about Jesus, second coming of the Lord. Then, turn with me if you will, again, second chapter. Uh, I'm going to give you the background. Second chapter, Daniel 2, 46 through 49. Daniel is promoted, and the king is acknowledging 
the Lord of Daniel. 46. The king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king. So he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Now think with me. Here's this king, Nebuchadnezzar, revealed the perfect plan of God that is to take place during his time and down through the ages. He acknowledges to Daniel, paid homage to Daniel, your God is the greatest of all. So I'm going to make you ruler. Prefect means it's like a judge over others, like the Supreme Court judge. And I'm going to make, upon Daniel's request, all your friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, also leaders. Now, after he made the statement, now come to chapter 3, see what happens. King Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. I'm going to be reading um, from chapter 7 from now on, part by part, explained it to you. Starting from verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and his breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plains of Dura in the province of Babylon. The king Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the set, uh, satraps. Satraps are some kind of generals over provinces. And prefects, as I told you, they're like judges. And the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the prefects are over justices the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, prefects, and governors, and counselors, and treasurers, the justices, and magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, Backpipe and every kind of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. From this scripture, what I got is this Our faith gets tested when we are ordered to obey things that are not of God's, ungodly ways, ungodly rules. It seemed to me that Nebuchadnezzar deliberately made a statue. Remember Daniel said, you are just the golden head. Someone is going to come right after you. And I explained it to you last Sunday that a lesser kingdom, Medo-Persians, would come. But this king does not want to accept the fact. He said, no one is going to defeat me. I'm going to make this big old statue of gold. And now this one, I put a picture up there for you to take a look. This is just an artistic rendition. And it was believed back in the culture, they would make a wooden statue overlaid with gold. And it says in cubits, I translate it, it is 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. 
huge. And he set that, out, set that statue in the plains of Dura. Now, to your right, there is an archaeological evidence today that shows that in the plains of Dura, they did find some stages built for, the, for this statue. It is very true what happened in Babylon back in the days. It's a historic place today. So he set that up. Do you know that our Statue of Liberty, you know how, how tall that is? Can anyone take a guess? Well, I, I did research. And from the base up on top of the statue is 151 feet. But the base alone is 65 feet. So the statue is shorter than this, four feet shorter than this. Statue of Liberty is 86. This is 90 feet. Tall. So the king ordered all these officials to come. Babylonian symphony orchestra playing music. And then he said in arrogance, if you do not bow before this idol that I set up, which means I am the golden statue, I'm it. If you don't, Bow before, I will destroy you. There is a fiery furnace set up for you. I will throw anybody who would say no to that. Arrogant statement. Now, what does it do with our life today? Hollywood, the music industry, the elite in political system, rich and famous, both houses of rulers here. They set up an image called liberalism, ultra-liberalism. And it seemed to me, if you don't bow your heads, we will destroy you. That's what I hear. If you do not follow what we are telling you, we will do everything possible to destroy this country and you. So our faith get tested when we are up against these kind of rulers, tells us to do something against God's word. That's precisely what Nebuchadnezzar did. He acknowledged to Daniel not too long ago that your God is the God of gods. No one can stand before him. And then he turns around, make the gigantic statue of himself, so to speak, and tells them, you better bow down before this. If not, we'll destroy you. That's why we're here today. You better listen to us. You better listen to our liberal agenda. You better listen to our Greenpeace deal. You better listen to everything. I don't care whether you pay $5, $6, or $10 a gallon. We don't care. We will destroy you. They may not say it, but that's what we see, it, right? We are being destroyed every day. Babies are destroyed in the name of abortion. I talked about that on Mother's Day. So our faith gets tested when we are ordered to obey things that are not godly. This king did that. Secondly, our faith gets tested when malicious people try to slander and destroy you. Let me read. Continue. Daniel 3, 8 through 15. Therefore... At that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, and bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay absolutely no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar is so furious he commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. 
So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, I'll give you another chance. When you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, backpipe, backpipe, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the image that I have made. Then it's well and good. I'm not going to do anything. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning furnace. And then he made a statement. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? These Chaldeans had an obvious political agenda here. Because these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three of them, have been promoted to a higher position. And now, these guys were looking out. Now think with me. No one really made note of those guys not being present there. Nobody, except these guys. So they made note because they are so malicious, they were looking out, what is going to happen to these guys? Where are they? We want to destroy them. So they were so malicious, so the Bible says, and they were gossiping or slandering these guys before the king. Oh, king, look at him, look at them. And I, I, I want you to punish them because they're not obeying you. Even the king did not make a note of that, but these guys are reminding him. You know, it happens in, in our time. Even in the ministry, it happens. In your job places, it happens. Ask me. It happens. Malicious people try to destroy you no matter what. And people in the media, that's exactly what they're doing today, is to destroy good ones. And I call them the agents of the devil. Those malicious people, whether they're in the higher ups or lower ups, in any place in between, they are there to destroy Christian faith. They are there to destroy Christian families. They are there to destroy the family system. They are there to destroy babies. They are there to destroy our Christian heritage. They are there to destroy everything that we have ever experienced as Christians. They wanted to destroy. Those are malicious folks. All I tell you is that turn the, the, the liberal media, as you know, they're there to destroy Christian faith. Malicious. You know, 1 Peter 5, 8, we all know that. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He plans to devour. The devil cannot be happy if your family is blessed. The devil cannot be happy if you are given something new in your life that God is going to raise you. He's not happy. So he's going to use his adversaries to maliciously put you down. It's a political game this king is playing. Saying that, give them another chance. And I want you to think with me. We will not encounter devil like the image we see with pitchfork, with a foot long ears, and lion teeth. No, we don't encounter him. But we will encounter him in the form of prime ministers, presidents, vice presidents, kings, senators, congressmen, judges, in every other way. Yes. And Satan would disguise himself as the angel of light. He gets into people. I'm not only talking about leaders. I'm going to talk, maybe a person that you know, your neighbor, your relative, he can get into people. Satan would always come through people to destroy you. Let me give you an example. Listen to this carefully. This, I'm, I'm just quoting what was written in the history. In 1936, Herr Baldur von Chirac, the German name, he was head of the youth program in Nazi Germany. And he said this, if we act as true Germans, we act according to the laws of God. Whoever serves Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, serves Germany. 
and whoever serves Germany serves God. And I unquote. We know Hitler was the incarnation of the devil. We know that. Then how come that people, if you, if you watch, watch the, the footings that happened, they were so blind. They did not see what was coming. Everyone was listening to quotes like this. The Germans did not see the truth, so they did not hesitate to kill the Jews. Now let me bring that to our time. When people do not see the incarnation of the devil and his diabolic moves in our society, they would not hesitate to burn CVSs, they would not hesitate to burn churches, they would not hesitate to bring the gun and shoot people up, they would not hesitate to loot the, the malls, they would not hesitate to do anything. Because they don't see it. The devil blinded their eyes, and then these leaders are the incarnation of the devil himself. I'm not naming anybody. You know them. If I do name them, Facebook would cut me off. But you know them. You know, I, I, I came up with the word. It's so interesting. I'm not sure whether you heard this particular phrase, word. I'm, I'm going to give that to you. When people live under this kind of influence in any country, in any family, any society, any county, or any state, they are not living under democracy. They are living under demonocracy. You know what demonocracy means? By the devil and for the devil. I say that because here is the statement of this king. is that, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Don't you know that? Nobody can escape. This is we. We're going to rule, and you're going to listen. And these are the folks, or the monuments, or the incarnation of devil himself. You do your job. We'll put you in the front line. You may be shot as a cop, and you may die. We don't care. Because it is what we call demonocracy, folks. King Nebuchadnezzar was demon-possessed man. He said, who is the God? What happened to the statement he made? He was so self-centered, diabolic person. Our faith gets tested. Definitely by malicious people. Thirdly, our faith gets tested when we face life-threatening situations. Now let me read that again. Continue reading. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They had the nerve to talk to the king that way. You know, there are all kinds of people. There, there are what we call pessimistic people, a person who tends to see the worst in everything. They're pessimistic people. And there are optimistic people, the person who tends to be hopeful and confident about the future. And they are, there are people whom we call realists. There are those who accept the situation as it is and prepare to deal with it accordingly. And there are futurists, a person who studies the future and makes predictions based on the current events. They're futurists. They're pragmatists. We all know they're a person who, who's guided by, by making conclusions based on Practical issues. They're futurists. And, uh, pragmatists, I should say. And then there are fatalists. What they would say? They believe that things are inevitable. You have no choice. You could pr protest. You could go to the polling. Nothing will ever go to change. They are fatalists. But here's the word. I coined that. Listeners, listen to me. Use this. This may find the place in the dictionary sometime. I hope so. 
I gave a title because of these guys. They are fatists. Not fatalist, not pragmatist, not futurist, not realist, not optimist, not pessimist. They are fatists. Why I coined that word fatist? Because of the statement they said. Imagine the enormous pressure on these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to compromise their compatriots, their competitors, and all the, the officials, the king, everyone watching what these guys are going to say. Under enormous pressure to compromise. Now, I put a few reasons. They could have thought about a few things. They said nothing we're going to gain by saying no to the king. We might die. So why not? Or we are in a different place. We're not in Jerusalem. We are in Babylon. If you're in Rome, be like a Roman. If you're in Babylon, be like a Babylonian. There's nothing wrong. Let's compromise. Oh, if you say no to the king, we will lose our job, our standard of living. You know, we've just been promoted to rule the provinces. We won't have that. We'll be stripped off of that. There's a reason to compromise. They probably must have thought, after all, we're, we're not called to renounce our God. The king is not telling you, your God, Jehovah, renounce him. So what? I can just bow my head for just 10 minutes for the king. This not going to really affect. I can even bow my head and then maybe pray to my God. Right? They had all these. And then another excuse. Everybody else is doing. The entire country is doing. Why not? I, we do. We're just odd number here. It's only once so God will forgive. Because we are here to do the... The, the purpose of God, so why not do that? You know, many Christians compromise because it's just for 10 minutes, for just one incident. It's just one, one election you know, cycle. It's it just, just one day. It's five minutes. Why not we just enjoy that? What they do, they try to compromise. And these guys... They had all these reasons. I just put those reasons because I thought if I were in their shoes, I would think about all that. Come on now, nothing is going to happen. I've just been promoted, right? But I learned from their life. They are faithists. Faithists are this. They would say, though you slay me, Lord, I'm not going to deny you. They did not doubt God's ability to deliver them from the fiery furnace. At the same time, they do not presume on God's will. They said, whatever is God's will, we will give. We don't care. It means, just like Job, though he slay me, I will not deny. I will trust you. I have my own desires, dreams, may not come to fruition, and yet, I am going to trust you. They're called faithists. Now let's read. See what happens. Daniel 3, 19 through 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more. Then it was, then it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their garments, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Stupid idea, ain't it? I mean, they're going to throw in the fire. Why bind them? Have you ever thought of that? I mean, they're closing everything. Apparently, this king said, well, that, those guys can probably run around, may run out. Seven times heat it up. How in the world are they going to run? But he was so diabolic, he wants to tie them up. Now, let me make a, a comparison today. Even though you want to do something for God, in the face of adversity, the devil wants to tie you up. Tie your hands and tie everything else. See what happens. Now let me continue. Verse 22. Because the king's rulers was urgent and the furnace overheated, 
The flame of the fire killed those men, men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Can you believe? Even the flames killed the mighty men, and yet he ordered them to be bound. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound in the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, rose up in haste. He declared to his counselor, did we not cast three men bound in the fire? The answer and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, there, there's an artist rendition. I will put it up there. The fourth man in the fire. We know that is pre-incarnated Christ walking with them. And I put right in my notes, there are furnaces in our lives. There are three kinds of furnaces that we face. The first one, what I call the furnace that man prepares. People dig holes to you. They maliciously point fingers at you. They would stop your promotions. They would stop anything that God is going to do in your life. They would stop at no expense to, to really put you down. That's man-made furnaces. Secondly, there are furnaces that Satan prepares for you. Satan in the form of the rulers, in the form of anybody, even in the form of sickness. As you well know, sometimes Satan would send some terrible things upon God's people. His job is to destroy. We know in the Old Testament, Job, he suffered physically, economically, relationally. He lost everything. Satan did that. Some of us could be in that kind of a furnace. The last one might even surprise you. There are furnaces that God prepares. Now, why would God put us through a furnace? It's called a test. Now, the beautiful thing about that is this. Remember Abraham? He had that furnace. Abraham was told by God to take his own and only son Isaac to go to Mount Moriah to kill him. That was a furnace. Can you imagine a father waited all his life, 100 years? Suddenly he got a little boy and God asked him, go and sacrifice him. But the beautiful thing about God's furnace is that God would never let you go through the furnace. He would stop you before you get into that heat. He wants to test you. But all the other furnaces by men or the devil, he will be there. And let me, let me kind of ask you a question. Probably you never thought of that. I don't read that in the scripture. Perhaps you have read. If you, let me know. I don't read that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have recognized the fourth man in the fire. I don't read that. It was the king who recognized they probably didn't even know that Jesus was with them. The only thing they made a commitment is that even if the Lord is not going to deliver, we will not deny, guess what Jesus did? I'm going to jump in with you, buddies. You may not even see God when you're going through this furnace, but He's always there for you. That's a beautiful thing about God. He's there. I don't read these guys even saw Jesus. The only thing they knew is they were unbound and they were not burned. They were just walking like they were walking on the beach. Cool breeze. Walking around in the furnace. The king walked there and said, my goodness, bring them out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come on out. Let me read, continue. The last verses of this chapter. Daniel 3, 26-30. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Can you believe he changed the tune now? Come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over their bodies of those men. The hair of the heads was not sighed, singed, I should say. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
who has sent his angels and delivered his servants, who trusted him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Amazing statement. Just think about that. Keep that in the back of your brain because this guy is making all kinds of statements and finally what happened to him as we go through the book of Daniel. Therefore, I make a decree, King said, any people, nation, or language that respects anything against God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego shall torn limb for limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Bab Babylon. Now, what happened to the statue, I guess, they melted that gold and took it, and everybody dispersed. Now, something happened. Miracle. We probably heard the story. The king commanded them to come out. Everyone sees that even their hair was not burnt. Second time, King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the king, the king of kings, the lord of lords. Make note of that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were able to say what they said to the king because they totally surrendered to God their body, their spirit, their soul. We don't care. That's why the book of Romans we read, present your bodies as a living sacrifice every day. Folks, whether your faith is being tested because we are ordered to follow rules that are not Christian, whether our faith tested because of malicious people, whether our faith get, gets tested when we face life-threatening furnaces, I want you to know, whether man-made, Satan-made, even God sent you, He's there with you. He jumps in with you, folks. Take heart, regardless of what you face. God is with you. Therefore, Submit your body, soul, and spirit to the Lord. And I want you to know, even though we might not see Jesus, there are times we pray and pray that we don't see, but He's there. He's with us. With that wonderful hope that's closer worship and prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your presence in my life, in Christians' lives, Millions of Christians in our land praying in their lives. Oh, we are facing the furnace. There's absolutely no doubt. Satan comes in the form of all kinds of people. Yes, there is a symphony orchestra called Hollywood. They're playing their bagpipes, dancing according to the tunes, the liberals, and those that are mocking Christ could be even so-called Christians mock Christ because they compromise. But these Hebrew boys said, we will not. They did not presumptuously said, we know God's will. But they said, we will commit our body, our soul and spirit to God. O oh Lord, what a beautiful thing that you jumped in. Lord, we want you to jump in in our midst today. We're walking through, going through furnaces. And I pray for those that are listening. We don't know what kind of a furnace they're in. It could be a simple sickness or it could be a word from the doctor. I begin with 10 reasons why sometime our faith gets tested. We don't know where they are. But Father, I know you would give the victory. You will jump in with us. Lord, thank you for the revelation of God, the Holy Spirit, through chapter 3. Help us to stand for Jesus. Never compr compromise for one moment for anything the devil offers. Because the victory is of the Lord. And I pray for those they are not Christians, Father. I pray they would come to know the Lord Jesus when they face tests, trials in their lives. They may not know where to turn to because they don't know Jesus. May they come to know the Lord Jesus and accept you as their personal Savior. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the intervention of God the Holy Spirit. Now send us home with the assurance 
there are times we might not see Jesus. We certainly don't seem to find him in our country right now, but I have no doubt in my mind he's here. He would jump in. Lord, help everyone to see and witness that the fourth man is with every Christian today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the summer-like afternoon. Tomorrow is going to be spring, back into the springtime. Appreciate you all. Enjoy the day. Thank you for being here. God bless you.